Migrations tend to be selective rather than random in terms of skills and ambition, as well as in origins and destinations. The immigrant population from a given country living in another country is often highly atypical of the population in the country from which they came in terms of their geographical and social origins. During the era of large-scale emigration from Sweden in the late 19th century, for example, few Swedes left their homeland from the favorably situated flatlands and forested regions of the country, while most left from regions lacking these advantages. Similarly, migration from southern Italy began in remote mountain regions with the most backward agriculture. Most of the Italian immigrants to Australia in the pre-World War II era came from areas which contained only 10% of the population of Italy. In 1979, more than half of all the migrants to the countries of the Middle East from India came from a single state, Kerala, a state containing less than 3% of India's population. Not only do immigrants often differ from the general populations of the respective countries from which they come, this selective migration is differently selective from one country to another. Thus, late 19th century immigrants to the United States from Greece and Spain were illiterate much less often than immigrants from Italy, even though illiteracy was more prevalent among the general populations of Greece and Spain than among the general population of Italy. Destinations have likewise not been random. Rather, particular destination points have tended to be linked to particular points of origin. Immigrants from particular towns in Lebanon often settled in clusters together in particular towns in Colombia. Among Lebanese immigrants to the West African nations of Sierra Leone and the Ivory Coast, there was likewise a concentration of people from particular locations in Lebanon in particular parts of the new countries where they settled. However, such patterns have not been peculiar to the Lebanese. Italian immigrants from Calabria settled in Calabrian farming communities in Australia. Italian fishermen from North Messina and Molfetta provided most of the fishermen in the Australian port of Fremantle. Italians from Stromboli created a predominantly Italian village in New Zealand. Balkan immigrants from one region of southern Dalmatia settled together in one part of Santa Cruz, California. Similar patterns of concentration have existed among Swedish immigrants in North Dakota, Macedonians settling in Toronto, and Japanese immigrants to the Philippines. Often, there have been occupational specializations accompanying regional concentrations of immigrants. For example, more than half the Greek immigrants from the Dodecanese island of Simi became fishermen in Australia, while those from Ithaca became caterers. Similarly, in Indonesia in the late 20th century, Hokkien Chinese were prominent in dealing in such products as rubber, coffee, pepper, and tobacco, while the Cantonese and Hakkas were more prominent in rice milling, lumber mills, machine shops, and soap factories. The linking of people from specific places of origin in one country to specific destinations in another has in some cases extended right down to the neighborhood level. Jewish immigrants from Poland settled in different streets on the Lower East Side of New York from the streets occupied by Jews from Russia, Hungary, or Romania and German Jews lived in very different parts of the city from Eastern European Jews on the Lower East Side. Italians from different regions of Italy have settled in different neighborhoods, whether in Buenos Aires, Toronto, New York, or other cities. Recent Irish immigrants to Sydney, Australia, settled in different and poorer parts of the metropolitan area from those Irish immigrants who had arrived earlier. In Bombay, particular streets are occupied by people who migrated there from particular regions or even particular villages in India. Immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe and their descendants remained geographically distributed in the United States in very different regional patterns from that of the American population as a whole as late as 1980. Asian Americans were likewise distributed among the regions of the country in their own distinctive patterns. Behind such migration patterns often lay particular beginnings of a new community in a new land when one pioneering individual, family, or group of families decided to try their luck overseas. Once established, immigrants from a particular village, city, or region became sources of highly localized information about the new country and, in the case of family members especially, often provided tangible help in moving and resettlement. Most of the Irish immigrants who left Ireland for the United States during the Great Famine of the 1840s 
had tickets for the voyage prepaid by family members already living in America. Many Irish immigrants to Argentina also traveled on tickets prepaid, either by earlier immigrants or by prospective employers. It was once common for Lebanese businessmen in West Africa or Indian businessmen in East Africa to provide jobs for younger family members who later followed them to their new country of settlement, and Chinese businessmen have done the same in Southeast Asia. These linkages of successive waves of immigrants from particular families or communities have been called chain migration. More than 90% of the immigrants to Australia over a period of half a century came via the chain migration process. In Australia, as in the United States, letters sent back home were a major factor in others' decisions to follow in the footsteps of the early immigrants. Yet, while the majority of Southern Europeans settled in ethnic concentrations in Australia, most of these concentrations were not wholly unmixed communities, representing people from only one town or village back home. Similarly, in late 20th century New York, a cluster of immigrants from India concentrated in a few buildings, though still interspersed among other groups in the neighborhood. In these and other cases, it is not that a particular group could exclude immigrants from other countries or exclude citizens of the country in which they settled. Rather, they simply clustered together where they could. To one degree or another, however, immigrants have also tended to assimilate, first with compatriots from different parts of their country of origin, and later with members of the larger society around them in the country where they settled. Sometimes the patterns have been more complicated. Polish and other Slavic immigrants from parts of Germany, which had been taken from their ancestors by German conquerors, often followed in the wake of German immigrants, with whose language and ways they were familiar. Thus, American cities with large numbers of German immigrants, Milwaukee, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, later attracted large numbers of Polish immigrants from Prussia, who tended to settle in the German sections of town. Similarly, Eastern European Jews often settled in the midst of, or adjacent to, Polish immigrants, Jews from Galicia near Poles from Galicia, Jews from Lublin near Poles from Lublin, and so forth for other regions. This did not necessarily represent friendliness between Jews and Poles. On the contrary, Jews and Poles in Chicago were notoriously unfriendly toward one another, but likewise found each other commercially indispensable as tradesmen and customers, respectively, who were used to one another's methods and languages. Sometimes the pattern is more complicated in another way. After members of a given immigrant family become established in a new land, they may send for relatives who were scattered at various locations. Thus, a Greek family living in Sydney and Melbourne encouraged relatives living in Greece, Turkey, and Egypt to join them in Australia. But although those who followed were not geographically concentrated, neither was the migration random in terms of the human connections involved. Both the origins and the destinations of migrants have changed dramatically over time. Most Lebanese emigrants from the 17th century to the middle of the 19th century went either to Egypt or to European cities, which had trade links to the Middle East, such as Livorno, Marseille, and Manchester. But, from the second half of the 19th century on into the early years of the 20th century, Lebanese immigrants went to the Western Hemisphere, and after that, they began to migrate to colonial West Africa. Many factors were at work to produce these changes, but they did not produce randomness. Nor were the immigrants always culturally the same, even when they came from the same country. Emigrants from Syria, Lebanon, to Egypt up through the middle of the 19th century tended to be either Christians or Jews from large cities, such as Damascus and Beirut, while those who went to the Western Hemisphere in a later period tended to be Christians from mountain villages, and in a still later period those who immigrated to West Africa were predominantly Shiite Muslims from southern Lebanon. The fact that others in their countries of destination might lump them all together as Lebanese or Syrians, or, in Argentina, Turks, when the immigrants came as subjects of the Ottoman Empire, did not mean that these were the terms in which they thought of themselves or behaved toward one another. Often, the hostilities which divided them in their country of origin continued to divide them after they settled overseas, whether in Sydney, Paris, London, New York, Dakar, or Sao Paulo. It is easy enough to understand how immigrants from an agricultural background in the cold lands of Scandinavia 
would settle in agricultural communities in the cold lands of Minnesota or Wisconsin, or how Chetyar moneylenders from India would become moneylenders in Burma or Malaya. What is more challenging is to understand how unskilled workers from southern China would become retailers throughout Southeast Asia and in the Caribbean and North America, and how so many of their offspring would later become engineers, mathematicians, and physicians in these same countries. Without assuming predestination, we may nevertheless find clues in the geographic settings in which their cultures evolved and in the historical influences which were also at work.